Hello and welcome. Today I'm very excited to present you Microsoft Identity Access Management uh, a series of videos. Actually these are seven videos here and uh, this video was created um, based on the demand by several of my viewers and I'm very glad that I could come out with this presentation. Now um, as you probably would appreciate that identity access management is a very large area, very big topic to discuss and obviously it was impossible for me to accommodate all the content, all the requirement into one single video. That's why we have um, seven videos for you. I hope uh, you will find them very exciting. I hope you will find them very rich in terms of content. And as all of my videos are augmented with a live demo and that makes uh, the concepts uh, clearer and better to understand, easier to understand and that is the effort here. I would like to take a brief moment to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Atul Raizadeh. Uh, I am a senior cloud security architect for several years. I've been helping customers of all kinds, all types, all sizes for many years, especially the Fortune 500 companies. Um, I would like to share my experiences with you as a way to give back to community. And if it can help you in your current engagement, current challenges, then I think I have done my job. Uh, with that, let's just uh, dive into the presentation. And um, before I actually get to the presentation, it would not be good for me not to mention about Microsoft here. And um, I personally feel that Microsoft has done a really, really commendable job in terms of identity access management because it addresses all the necessary component of cloud, which is, you know, when we talk about cloud, we talk about agility, we talk about speed, we talk about robustness, we talk about scalability, we talk about security, we talk about compliance, we talk about governance, right? A whole lot of ground to be covered uh, from the cloud perspective. Right? And um, when you look into this presentation and if you are able to complete all seven videos, you would realize that how powerful this solution is and what kind of a great work Microsoft team has done. So kudos to the Microsoft team. All right, so without any further ado, let's just get into the presentation. And before we go to this first presentation, I just want to give you a glimpse of uh, these seven videos, what it brings for you so that you're prepared to plan your, uh, your viewing of these videos appropriately. Most of the videos are gonna be more than an hour, unfortunately, because the content is so large and the content is so rich as well. But I can also assure you that uh, once you invest your hour into these video, uh, you will not be disappointed. That's my promise. And hopefully I meet my promise and uh, your comments and remarks would let me know whether I stand to my promise or not. So the scope of this presentation uh, is, uh, as I said earlier, is distributed between seven different videos or presentations. The very first video, uh, that is the today's video, would revolve around AI Directive Directory. I'm not going to read all the content because the videos would become too large. You would have the opportunity to look into each presentation and get acquainted automatically. So presentation two, which will be around authentication and authorization. Presentation three would augment, uh, both actually presentation three and four would augment the concept that we have discussed in video one and video two with a very rich live demo around Azure Active Directory, um, B2B, B2C, as well as deployment of AD Connect and different Azure AD authentication. It also goes into the details of, uh, you know, how to deploy different options and what is the implication, what is the end user experience, so that when, if you are in the process of making these decisions, your decision making becomes easier from all, all aspects, whether it is the complexity of the solution, whether it is the cost, whether it is the high availability, whether it's a DR, whether it is uh, the end user experience, right? So that's very important. I'm 
uh, optimistic that both video three and video four would help you to get that level of understanding and comfort, which is very important. The video five would revolve around the role-based access control, which is a very important part, especially from the zero trust architecture perspective. Video six uh, would continue that thought process that uh, we discussed in, um, in RBAC and we'll talk about identity governance. And in this space, we will be discussing um, privilege identity management, which revolves around two major concepts of GAEA, which stands for just enough access, and JIT, which is just in time administration. So this is a very powerful stuff that supports your zero trust architecture. And we will also discuss entitlement management, which is around access package of self-service RBAC. Presentation video uh, or video seven would be around identity security. It is a very, very important uh, video that would uh, you know, take care of all the concepts that we have discussed in earlier videos and combine them together to make sure that when you architect your identity access management for your organization, you have taken into consideration and taken all the advantages and necessary protection from the security perspective. So that is the, the big scope here, right? Um, as far as the, the, the series of videos are concerned. Moving on uh, for the very first topic uh, of this presentation of this video, which is video one, is Azure Active Directory, right? And I think many of you are already familiar with Azure Active Directory. This is uh, not new. This has been there for almost now nine, 10 years. So uh, most of you are familiar with Azure Active Directory, but let's see what uh, this particular video can, can address in terms of topics. Uh, so the first thing that we will be discussing would be an Azure Active Directory overview followed by a comparison between an Azure Active Directory and on-prem Active Directory. There is a confusion for many people around it. We'll discuss the different feature sets based on different SKUs. Then we'll go into Azure Active Directory identity types. This is very important to understand and we'll discuss members versus external identities. Members, I'll call them internal identities for <laughs> For the lack of better words which will be synced non-synced and it also includes guests which also goes into the external identity space we we'll talk about b2c service principles and manage identity so this is the scope of this video and i am sure this is going to be very exciting for many of us i just want to make uh, take a moment here to say i generally uh, say we instead of i when i'm actually sitting alone in this room and making this presentation. Um, the reason is that I always think my audience is with me, right? So I always think that you are sitting with me and that's why I intend to, intend to see, say, we, I'm sorry, I mean, it didn't make no sense to you, but um, unfortunately I can't change it. It's too hard for me to change my habit. I always think that you guys are sitting with me. So please bear with me for this nonsense, but um, I would be saying me, we all the times in my all my presentations if you follow me. Thanks for your understanding. Um, let's move on. And let's see what is Azure Active Directory. As I said, you already know Azure Active Directory, you are using Azure Active Directory, but just let's look at it at a very high level. What is Azure Active Directory? So for me, um, Azure Active Directory is a Microsoft multi-tenant managed identity service. Looks complicated, right? It is not, actually. Once you will uh, go into my demo, I will be able to establish this thought process and uh, we will be able to see how this multi-tenant managed identity services actually, uh, you know, stands to its own naming convention here. But, um, uh, what I intend to say here is uh, with this multi-tenant managed identity service is that um, each tenant, each tenant, whether that's an Azure tenant or whether that's an O365 tenant is, is uh, uh, associated with one directory service as with one Azure Active Directory. That's just the default, right? That's a default architecture for Microsoft Cloud. You cannot envision a single tenant without an Azure Active Directory. 
And as I was saying in my earlier video that Microsoft has really, really done a great job. This is actually augmented and reflected. Uh, if you look on the, uh, the Gartner uh, Magic Quadrant here for access management, this is very latest. This is for November 2020, which is very, very last month only. And you will see and you will find that Microsoft is at the top in terms of access management here. And that speaks and that augments what I said earlier that this is a great work, great, great job by Microsoft program team behind identity access management. Now, as um, um, Azure Active Directory serve as the, um, you know, multi-tenant managed identity services for Microsoft Cloud. So this is, this becomes a central or a pivotal position, uh, pivotal point for all Microsoft apps, right? So whether this is Microsoft 365 or Azure or any other apps that you're doing, including different other applications that you or your organization is working. So you cannot conceive a deployment of a Office 365 or a modern workspace or anything in Azure without leveraging Azure Active Directory. That's the, that's the nature, right? So this is the reason this is so very important, whether you talk about users, device, principles, manage identities, anything that you do in Azure or in O365 would revolve around Azure Active Directory. That is the reason this video is so very important, friends. And um, I'm gonna try to show you that how this solution is so holistic, right? And instead of just dealing in a silos here, this series of video would be a very holistic approach to identity access management. That's my effort. Now, moving on, once we understand the concept of the multi-tenant managed identity services, basically this is a, is a huge uh, container of identity services and each tenant, uh, whether that's O365 tenant or an Azure tenant, is siloed by these directory services. So within this big man multi-tenant managed services, and that's the reason once you go into the video, you will find that if you are in one Azure tenant, you and you want to, and you know, somebody else from another Azure tenant wants to access your services, it becomes so easy because this is one single multi-tenant managed identity services, right? And I hope that makes sense. The video would also show you and make, make you understand it better. Moving on to the next topic of this presentation is uh, trying to compare the on-prem Active Directory domain services versus Azure Active Directory. And I'm surprised that um, even uh, the history of Azure Active Directory for so long, almost now nine or 10 years, there are people who are still confused about on-prem Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. Often I have seen people think that it is one and the same thing. And unfortunately, that is not true, right? When we talk about on-prem active directory domain services, before we start comparing these two, right? Uh, let, let's try to understand the conception of these two directory services, when they were conceived, right? On-prem active directory domain services were introduced back in 2000. And if you recall, in 2000, there was zero concept of cloud. So obviously there was no use case for cloud. And that's the reason when the Active Directory Domain Services was conceived, introduced and delivered, um, it was not uh, meant for cloud, right? So that's for the lack of better word. That's the reason it is way different than the Azure Active Directory, which was from the day one, it was perceived, designed, planned, architected for cloud. And I hope that establishes the groundwork here that why these are two different identity services, right? Whether that's Active Directory domain services compared to Azure Active Directory. Now, um, I want to take a brief moment here to briefly touch about the directory services. And though all of us have been using uh, Active Directory or other Active Directory for quite some time, and it would be, a, you know, we'll say, why are we talking about what is the directory services? But I have seen confusion around it. I just want to make sure that I touch it in a very simplistic way. 
And when we talk about a directory services, if you, you know, um, disconnect yourself temporarily from being an IT guy and just become a normal person, you organize your information uh, on your laptops or your devices in a way, in a certain order, right? Each person has their own way to do that. You have your folder structure for different activities, different information that you have. You have your personal folder, you have your organization folder, you might have your HR folder, invoices folder, bills folder, mortgage folder, taxes folder, your family pictures folder, right? That's how you organize it. This, this is no brainer to all of us, right? No one, everybody at this point in the modern world um, in literate world uses uh, information and they organize information into folders. When we talk about directory services, I don't think it's any different than that. A directory services is a way to organize your organization in terms of information, right? When we talk about an organization, uh, different uh, assets of your organization in terms of information are um, methodically programmatically organized into one service, which is a directory services, whether that service is an identity, which is a user or a group or a service um, or a networking component or your policies or your applications, right? And all that uh, you can put it together into a directory service, which is called as a directory services, right? And one of the most prominent directory services in the world is Microsoft Active Directory. I don't think anybody would disagree with me. It is hard to conceive any organization, small, large, any type, without running, without uh, using Microsoft Active Directory. It could be very, very rare to see any organization not using Active Directory. This is the power because this is how you organize yourself. This is how, and the protocol that is being used by Active Directory or Directory Services is LDAP, which is lightweight directory access protocol, right? And when we come to Azure Active Directory, it would be different and we'll see that. Uh, what is the difference? So right here, which is an LDAP directory, on-prem Active Directory is an LDAP directory, lightweight directory access protocol, while Azure Active Directory is a different animal to deal with. So that hopefully clarifies any doubt, if you had any doubt between on-prem Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. So let's look into the other factors and other areas that you should be um, looking into. First is obviously Active Directory is an on-prem directory services. Uh, no brainer here. Now Active Directory schema is different because it was created for a different purpose. So obviously once we go into Azure, you will see the difference here and I'll try to explain you why it is important for you to know. Then the credentials management in terms of Active Directory is password, certificate of authentication, or smart card authentication. I think all of us know it, how to authenticate to Active Directory, so I, there's no reason to waste any more time into that. But the important thing that makes a difference that you should remember, what are the key authentication protocol that Active Directory uses are basically lightweight directory access protocol, Kerberos, and TLM, and TLM and header based, right? These are the four different authentication options that you have in Active Directory, which would be different once we compare it with Azure. And when we talk about maintaining identity hygiene in on-prem Active Directory, basically, uh, how do you do that? Microsoft provides you group policy to control, you know, uh, to have the account policy, password policy, audit policy. You may also be having a separate process or policies in your organization for provisioning, deprovisioning, enabling, disabling accounts too, which is also an important part from identity hygiene perspective. And now we will compare it with Azure Active Directory. So looking into Azure Active Directory, as um, we have already established the fact that Azure Active Directory is a multi-tenant managed identity access service which was not the case with on-prem Active Directory. So clear cut differentiator here, or distinguisher here. Now, I, as I mentioned earlier, that this is a tenant-based directory service. So within this multi-tenant managed identity service, each tenant, whether O365 or Azure, is assigned a directory services, which is an Azure Active Directory instance, right? In that multi-tenant managed identity services, right? As a matter of fact, and you already know it, 
whenever you create an O365 tenant or whenever you create an Azure tenant, it automatically by default provisions this Azure Active Directory service for you. As I said earlier, you cannot conceive a O365 instance or Azure tenant without running an Azure Active Directory. That's how this whole thing, and that makes sense because you need identities, right, to manage your environment. And identities are uh, one of the core components of your security posture. That's why it is very important to stay focused on this, especially if you are considering and uh, trying to improve the overall security posture of your organization. Coming to the next point is credentials management is very similar uh, here, but no, I'm not, I'm sorry, I should not say similar. This is a password authentication, but in addition to that, it has a token-based authentication. Now, this is a game changer here, folks. If you recall back when we talk about on-prem Active Directory, on-prem Active Directory has no concept of token-based authentication. And token-based authentication brings the modern auth, which is what the cloud is, uh, which is uh, which is a cloud requirement, in, in fact. So now here we start getting into the uh, different differentiators here or differences here between an Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. Because your on-prem Active Directory cannot uh, leverage token-based authentication, that's why when we go down into the solutioning here, when we go down in architecting here, these things, these concepts are gonna play a significant role uh, in your understanding. And you would also see that why these videos have been planned and designed in this way, because each video when you go to the next video uh, is is actually a, a kind of a chain or a follow on from the video one you know, earlier video. So you will see that with what this token based authentication is going to offer you when we go to the authentication authorization video, which is the next video. Now supported authentication protocol here compared to the on prem active directory are different. Here we are talking about OAuth 2. We are talk, talking about SAML, we are talk on, talking about OIDC or OpenID Connect. And these are the modern authentication protocols, right? And that, if you are an application developer, you already know that the difference and it is how important these are in terms of cloud. And that's the difference. I forgot to mention about schema here in Azure Active Directory. Schema is way different than on-prem Active Directory. Now, why it is so important to bring it up here, you may not really be concerned about it because when you're working in cloud, you say, okay, why do I have to worry about the schema here? Now, in real world, when you start working into customer environment and organization and you start deploying solutions, you may end up having variety of COTS application or COTS database as a part of your um, infrastructure, right? And uh, when you talk about these COTS, um, then you would have to worry about their RBAC, which is our, I think, video six or video five. Now, when you talk about RBAC, these legacy COTS application or databases are very comfortable with on-prem Active Directory because this has been there for years. They know how, and you have already done it in terms of when you're configuring the RBAC for these COTS and this legacy COTS application, you can do with you know, LDAP or Kerberos very, very easily. And I think most of you who have experience in this industry uh, must have come to that um, challenge and you might have done that in the past already. But when you go into Azure Active Directory, unfortunately the schema is different. The protocols are different, right? By default, you do not see anything like LDAP or Kerberos there, especially in default Azure Active Directory. Then you will come into challenges and the schema is different. So when you configure an RBAC on an on-prem Active Directory with these cards, generally you would use the same account name as in one of the user attribute. I'm just giving an example here. That attribute, same account name, does not exist in Azure Active Directory schema. So now, even if you try to manipulate it, you are in real trouble, right? So that's why the challenges would come and I'm giving you this information upfront so that you do not burn yourself and waste your time. Having said that, you see that we have the protocols OAuth 2, SAML, OpenID. Now, what do we do with those applications or those services 
that are legacy application and legacy services and dependent on legacy protocols like Kerberos or MTLM, right? Or LDAP. How do we how do we deal with that? So Microsoft has also um, brought a feature about three four years back called as an Azure AD Domain Service. Um, and Azure AD Domain Services is an add-on component. You have to deploy this service uh, on top of Azure Active Directory, which could serve you and which could sell, help you to support with your legacy protocol, which could be NTLM, Kerberos, and LDAP. Having said that, your schema is still different, right? Keep remember that. And I'm not gonna dive very deep into Azure AD Domain Services because I have a separate video on my YouTube channel for Azure Active Directory Domain Services, you can go and look into it. This is a, that's a rich demo and that would explain you. But just to give you an insight that when people have used Azure AD Domain Services, I uh, have not seen people using it very frequently, to be honest. But the use case would be that uh, when you are in a data, site, data center migration path or migration journey, and you are migrating your services or applications from on-prem to Azure and your organization have decided because of multiple reasons not to extend your on-prem Active Directory into Azure Active Directory as infrastructure as a service. Remember that you can add additional domain controllers uh, on your VMs in Azure. And uh, many organizations do that. Uh, many organizations do not do that because of variety of compliance reasons. So if you're familiar with um, red forest concept that would be one of the reason that would prevent you to deploy domain controllers in Azure or there could be other compliance reason that you may not have to you do not want to put your domain controllers in Azure yeah right it depends on organizations and con your compliance requirements now in that case what if when you bring a service or an application and you want to migrate it from data center to Azure how do you support them in that case your Azure AD domain services could be could leverage that and the, the services could continue working fine as they were working on-prem if you have the Azure AD domain services running in your Azure tenant, right? So that's the use case. Um, honestly speaking, I haven't seen a um, lot many use cases, a lot many companies doing it because you know, there are certain challenges with this, one schema being one challenge and then number of, the, you don't have any control on the actual domain controllers that are being deployed for this domain services in Azure. This is all Microsoft managed. So there's, there are challenges with that route, right? So I've not seen many of the many customers using it. Now, as far as the identity hygiene is concerned, we saw that in on-prem Active Directory, you could use group policies, right? But uh, how do we do in Azure Active Directory? First of all, it will depend on identity types uh, and we will discuss that in, in the next uh, topic or so. Um, then you will understand it better. But um, Azure or Active Directory also provides you tools like password protection and password expiration policy to meet the similar challenges that you have uh, been tackling with group policies on on-prem Active Directory. So I think uh, uh, this uh, gives you a fairly good idea about um, why Azure Active Directory is different than on-prem Active Directory, what are the key differences between these two, and uh, obviously when you architect the solution, you have to take the, these um, you know, differences into account and then come out with your identity access management solution, right? All right, so let's move on to the next topic. And now this is very interesting again, folks, the Azure Active Directory features. And these features are dependent on whether you use a free version of your Azure Active Directory or you are using a paid version of your Azure Active Directory. As I said earlier that whenever you create a tenant, O365 on Azure, it automatically creates a free version of Azure Active Directory because you can do, uh, you can run your uh, O365 or Azure without a Azure Active Directory. So that's offered free. But in most scenario, and especially I coming from security background, I would strongly recommend that um, everyone should use the P2 subscription because of the challenge, because of the benefit that it brings to you from security perspective. 
And if you really, really want to make sure that your cloud environment is secure and compliant and you can manage it effectively, improve your overall cloud security posture, I cannot imagine that you can run your uh, organization without the P2 subscription. Now, this P1 and P2 subscriptions uh, you can buy is as a separate SKU just for Azure Active Directory Premium 1 or Azure Active Directory Premium 2 or it is also bundled in your other subscriptions. So for an example, if you have M365, Microsoft 365, E5 or E3 or Enterprise Mobility Suite, E3 or E5, or you have a, you know, the security E5 or compliance E5, many of these other SKUs include the P1 or P2. My recommendation to you, if you have already not visited this area, that look into your current uh, licensing or current excuse where you are and make, you make sure that you have the P2 licenses included into your licensing. And I think that's very important. If it's not, it is highly recommended that you talk to your leadership and convince them that you would need P2 licenses to make sure that your cloud posture is secure. And honestly speaking, folks, my experience tells me that many customers initially um, think, oh, may we, maybe we don't need P2. And as soon as, you know, they get into the cloud in next three, four, five, six months, once they realize the, the, the you know, security impact, and once, God forbid, any breach happens, any attack happens, then they go into panic mode and say, oh, oh, oh no, 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 let's do the P2 now, right? Um, I have seen it many, many times. Uh, trust me, folks, um, this is my personal experience and as, as, I, as I have the opportunity and privilege to work and consult to many organizations, uh, I have seen it happening so many times. So instead of going to that route and having a breach and having an attack and then do the P2, I think it would be wise and smart to take the P2 licenses into consideration from the day one of your deployment, right? That's my personal view, I'm not a Microsoft salesperson, I'm not a Microsoft employee, so um, don't mistake me that I'm trying to sell you something here, but um, once you see the value proposition on between this, then you would probably realize that why I'm saying it. Quickly comparing that, I think I don't need to read all the content, this is for you. I would like to, I would keep this that posted into the description so that it is ready for you. and. The few key things here that you will notice uh, and we'll come into the P1 and P2 shortly. These are the, this slide has got um, all of the features that you have is available across the, all three of them, whether it's a free P1 and P2. But um, there would be um, a feature, especially when we talk about, uh, sometimes it gets confusing. Um, uh, when you talk about self-service password change for cloud users, for an example, right? It is only for cloud users here. That does not mean that you will have the op option to write back and have a self-service password reset for back on your on-prem Active Directory. For that, you would need a P1 or P2 licensing, right? Now, as for password protection, globally, global band password is here. But when you go to the custom uh, band password that you want to do it, for that, you would need a P1 or P2, right? Let's move on and look into the other areas. Multi-factor authentication, we will talk about, we'll demo you in once we go to the security video, but um, it is available and Microsoft has offered it free, but free is all manual work and um, or you do a script and there are chances of, um, you know, uh, miss, missing someone, first of all, or second is that it is definitely an uh, operational overhead when you have a P1 or P2 licensing, especially with P2, you can enforce through conditional policies, conditional access policies, and um, in that case, it becomes much more powerful, right? So we'll see that once we get to that uh, last video, video seven. Um, now, when we start looking into P1 and P2, then the company branding and customization, this is very important. That is only possible with P1 and P2, especially once you go into the B2C scenario, and B2B scenario, this is gonna uh, be important to understand. The video that I have is gonna probably um, show you the difference between B2 and B2C, especially from branding perspective. Self-service password reset for cloud user. 
it was already there in the free right now um, you would also see device write back is available in p1 p2 object uh, device object two way synchronization right device not the user identity password protection custom band password right i mentioned to you earlier and then password protection for windows server active directory this is also you will see in the security video that what does it mean for globally and custom band password self service password reset change unlock with on premises right back this is what i was mentioning earlier it is available in p1 and p2 only the group access management microsoft cloud app discovery and cad and uh, azure ad join mdm auto enrollment right once you start looking in tune then you will go into p1 p2 here advanced security and uses report this is folks don't underestimate that this is very important when we got talk about security and compliance this is going to be your savior this is going to help us so this is not available in your free version that's the reason i am recommending to use p2 licensing and uh, if you keep going on so application proxy azure ad application proxy very very powerful solution it would also help you to improve your roi and tco i have a separate video demo on azure ad application proxy which i created probably three years back pretty much you could replace i'm not going to go into deep here but you could replace your dmz with azure ad application proxy and azure ad application proxy can become your dmz all traffic goes from azure ad application proxy especially if you have your um, on prem application running ntlm application or oh, sorry not sorry not ntm if they are using kerberos as an authentication protocol or voila this is the way to go you will have single sign on you will also have the ability to turn mfa and through conditional access policies here very powerful and i think last week or a week before microsoft has also announced now that azure ad application proxy would also support the header based authentication so now the this is way more interesting folks um this is very very powerful solution and especially you can showcase the value of your um skills and knowledge to your leadership by taking advantage of these features right this these things have a different a definitive impact on your roi right and um, uh, trust me folks when you do that you will realize that how impressed your leadership would be once you start deploying these services now um, microsoft identity manager cal which is the client access licenses for mim microsoft identity manager if you're not familiar with mim may i remind you that uh, there is a long history of microsoft naming behind it microsoft uh, introduced a service called as microsoft identity integration services mis in 2003 maybe you have heard about it then microsoft changed its name somewhere around in 2007 called as ilm which is identity life cycle management after that i think around 2010 microsoft changed the name to fim or forefront identity management i hope you might have heard that and lately microsoft has renamed this service to um, microsoft identity management extremely powerful solution folks and you will see once we go to the aed connect uh, deployment actually the aed connect uh, tool that we will be talking and discussing shortly in i think video 3 or video 4 um, is a customized and tailored version of mim specifically meant for cloud identity right so the mim uh, cal and mim is a very expensive product in terms of licensing this would give you the cals for uh, mim for p1 p2 uh azure ad connect health this is important especially for global organization large organization with you know 50000 100000 200000 objects to be synced uh, and these um, organization have come long way from multiple acquisitions and mergers and what not or divisions and their identities could have duplication identities could have white spaces identities could have you know proxy addresses are generally a problem Uh, email address proxy addresses so um you once you run the synchronization which is the topic i think i've mentioned uh, down the road in ad connect i think top in video 3 or something um you will see that um, ad connect would report errors and uh, you can look into the connect health uh, only in p1 and p2 dynamic groups 
a very interesting concept. It helps many, many organization only available P1 and P2. Group create permission delegation P1 and P2. Group naming policy is also available. Group expiration is very powerful, folks. Uh, don't underestimate it. This is also only available in P1 and P2. Right? People say, hey, I have given this access to these contractors, uh, consultants, put them into a group for a specific period of time. And as soon as the expiration comes into that contract, that group also expires, right? So automatically without worrying about, you know, a lingering access to these identities, you can take care of it. Uh, usage guidelines, default classification, conditional access. This is, this is what it is important, right? This is what is going to be a key area of security in last video. Azure Information Protection Integration, AIP. Man, this is very powerful from data governance perspective. And Microsoft is, uh, I think I last week also announced, or I think yesterday announced the product called as a Purview 2. We'll see how it comes in. But data governance, data classification, data protection is very important. Azure Information Protection is a way to go, friends. And if you have not watched my video on Azure Information Protection, please, please do watch that video. You will see how, what value proposition it brings to. I have opportunity to work with different DLP and you know, information protection solution from different vendors. I still personally feel without any bias that AIP is the way to go. It's a much better solution. It's very, very powerful. Please do watch that video. Uh, Multi-factor condition with conditional access. I mentioned earlier, I alluded earlier, the difference between uh, the free version and the P1 and P2 version. Cloud app security integration. So folks, um, as I said, I may sound like a broken record here. The way to go is P2, pretty much, right? To take all the advantage of security initiative that Microsoft has created. And trust me, Microsoft has invested billions and billions of dollars around security, right? So. Uh, to take the fullest advantage of all the good work that Microsoft has done behind security, um, it definitely make P2 as a valid candidate for your organization, in my personal view. Let's move on. Right, so these continues the features under P2 and see the prim, which is going to be the key for your uh, zero trust architecture, only available in P2. Risk-based conditional access policy only in P2. Risk event investigation only in P2. So I think now you understand why I'm saying that. Intelligent management, which is a self-service RBAC, only available in P2. So um, P2 is the way to go, friends, right? <laughs> All right. So now let's talk about identity types. And this is going to be interesting, folks. I have seen people are confused about um, the identity types. So when we talk about identity types, um, we can pretty much call them and categorize them into, for the lack of better words, into two areas. One is the members and second is the external identity. There is a slight overlap here and I'll try to explain you what that overlap is. So members, when we talk about Azure Active Directory members and going forward, we could have a three different types of identities. Actually, we can talk about five different types of identities here, but let's focus first on three. The three identities are, one of the identities could be the non-synced or cloud-only identities. So if you have, forget about on-prem Active Directory for a few minutes, when you create the tenant first time, the only identities that you create at that time is in the Azure Active Directory only. So you create an identity, you know, you can create the identity and password, and they are in only in Azure Active Directory. That's why cloud only identities. They authenticate only to the Azure Active Directory. That's what is um, your non-synced cloud identities. If you have experience of deploying the Azure Active Directory or Office 365, any identity that uh, you created would end up with pretty much uh, .onmicrosoft.com, right? So if your tenant name is, let's say, XYZ, then the identities that you would create in cloud 
would end up with XYZ dot on Microsoft dot com, right? And uh, <coughs> XYZ, I'm sorry, XYZ at dot um, uh, identity at xyz dot on microsoft dot com that would be the the upn that would be the naming convention for that and that's how you create the cloud only identities then comes the synced identities and now before we talk about the synced identities let's try to understand why do we need that so you can definitely create identities in cloud and have their password and user can authenticate all good right so the challenge number one is uh, especially when you are working with multiple identities. I'm sure you're not running with 10 or 20 identities. Uh, most organizations would have way more identities, 200, 500, 2000, 20,000, 200,000, and millions of identities. Now, to conceive and to do that manually, either even if you have a script, is going to be a challenge, and it is going to add operational overhead for you. Every time a new person joins your organization, now you need to worry about you need to add them manually, right? That's one operational nightmare. The second problem is that this identity that you create here in Azure uh, Active Directory is different than your regular identity that you use to log on to your network in your on-prem environment or from your Active Directory. So from an end user perspective, now they have two identities to think about it, especially in this environment. They might have 10 other identities for their other stuff from their social networking or Gmail or you know MSN or personal email addresses. Forget those things. But now we have added one more identity for them to remember, one more password to remember, one more password to manage, right? So now it is adding complexity and challenges and for all practical purposes, it may not make any sense for having and creating the cloud only identities. This is, there's always a best practice to have at least few, couple of identities in cloud only in case of any disaster or anything. That is what we will discuss in our security video. But in general, uh, just having a cloud only identities is not a very realistic and practical approach. And as I said, in cloud, we talk about simplicity. In, talk, in cloud, we talk about you know uh, uh, speed. We talk about uh, agility, right? All that stuff is not addressed with the cloud only identity. So for that, what we can do, we can leverage the your on-prem active directory and we can sync those identities into Azure. That's why the second type of identity is a sync identity. And the tool that you use, which I mentioned earlier is AAD Connect, which is what we are showing here. Oops. Um, which is I'm showing up here, AAD Connect which is the tool, which is a customized and tailored version of MIM, which I mentioned earlier, is the tool that would easily sync your on-prem identities to Azure Active Directory. And these are the synced identities. And obviously when you, sell, when you use these identities, it's not that you need to sync everything. You could be very selective, you could have filtering, and you can only bring the required users and group from your on-prem Active Directory to your Azure Active Directory. This is a unidirectional sync. That means it can only sync from on-prem Active Directory to Azure. It does not sync it back. I have seen people confused about that as well in my experience, right? So this is a unidirectional sync. It is not syncing back from cloud to Azure. There is one thing that can sync back that's optional component, which is called the write back option where you could write back passwords back on your on-prem Active Directory, right? That is the optional component that provides you a self-service password reset option, SSPR, where you can, users can unlock account, lock account, you know, reset their password, uh, all that good stuff. But other than that, it is always a unidirectional sync. So this is your second type of identity. So we discussed cloud-only identity, we discussed synced identity as members. The third type of members is a guest identity. Now guest identity deals with a B2B identity, which is again, in terms of identity classification, falls into an external identity. So in this case, what could happen is that you can invite users through their email address. Remember that this is a differentiator here. You will always have to invite users from their genuine email address. 
And once you invite these users from their email address, they would be able to register themselves into Azure Active Directory. Now, when you register except for one use case that we'll, I'll discuss shortly, every time you invite this user, that user has to create its own password for Azure Active Directory. So pretty much it's an identity inside Azure. The only difference is that the username that you were creating for creating a normal cloud identity, and instead of using a username, you need you use their email address, right? But these two identities, their email identity is a different identity and Azure guest identity is a different identity. I want to establish this fact loud and clear here. That means their password is different. Their authentication or IDP is different. Identity provider is different. When they go to their email, their identity provider is their email provider. When they come into Azure, their identity provider is Azure. This is very important and people get confused about it. Hey, my B2B is that somehow I will authenticate to back to my email provider and then somehow I will be allowed access. No, that's not true. This identity is authenticating against your Azure Active Directory, this particular instance, except for one use case. And what is that one use case? If you happen to invite that user from a different O365 or Azure Active Directory, right? So that is a, your partner, but that partner identity is um, an identity in their own Azure Active Directory or O365, which is a very large possibility, right? When you invite these people, they may have a corporate partner. They may already be using O365. O365 is so popular. In that case, it comes back to the concept that we talked earlier about a multi-tenant managed identity service. Remember that that particular identity is sitting in this model in another directory services for another tenant, right? In that case, your directory does not have to authenticate it because it will get authenticated from that Azure Active Directory, from the source Azure Active Directory. So if I have a partner that has an O365 account or email address, they will get authenticated. And by the way, they will also be prompted for MFA if that organization has done MFA, that organization has, if that organization using a single sign-on, they would get a single sign-on option too. The only thing probably that may be of concern to you that when, if that's the case, when you go into the security, you do not want to turn MFA at your directory services too, because that would, uh, that would enforce MFA twice to that user, which could be, you know, end user experience issues. So when you bring this in users, if they have already have an MFA, you probably do not want to turn MFA on, on these users, right? That's the only use case. Otherwise, these guest identities, which are B2B identity, business to business identities, they would always authenticate to your Azure Active Directory. So from any compliance security perspective, you are responsible for these identities. These are your identities, right? So making sure that you understand that. The last category in terms of external identity is Azure AD B2C, business to consumer. Now in this case, um, you could invite users from their social identities as well as from their personal, you know, partner email addresses too. But the difference here is that Azure Active Directory B2C is a separate directory services instance. It is not that these users are not stored in the same Azure Active Directory like B2B or synced or non-synced identity. Two separate directory services, complete segregation there. And that could serve a different purpose for your organization when you are talking about applications that you or your organization is managing or creating, right? And that's where Azure AD B2C comes into picture. So all social identities and uh, the once you get to the video, I think video three, then you will see this in action and that would make you understand it really, really. We also need to discuss about uh, service principles and manage identities and uh, that's a topic in itself, a uh, big topic. And instead of uh, dealing with this here, I already have a video around managed service, managed identities uh, at my YouTube channel. So I would request you to look at it. 
and that would give you the comparison between managed identities and service principles and how effectively you can leverage them and use them. I am a big proponent of managed identities. This definitely enhances your overall cloud security posture and it also helps you with your zero trust architecture. Very important folks, don't underestimate if you are architecting your solution, in my view, manage identities has to be a part of your solution, part of your architecture. Please do watch that video. That would give you a lot of insight on managed identities and why and how it is so important, but we'll move on. Uh, one more thing that before I leave this particular slide, I think that is very important to me from my personal experience perspective. This Azure Active Directory here, which we have talked about has different authentication protocol, also serves as a repository of identities. Remember, keeping an identity and uh, the authentication and authorization are two different things. So in a layman terminology, I can say Azure Active Directory is a bucket of identity. Authentication, we'll talk separately, right? If you can segregate identities with authentication and authorization, then this would make a lot of sense to you, which I'm talking, and it will also bring a lot of value to you and your organization. So when I say Azure Active Directory is a bucket of identity, what it means is that you can sync multiple Active Directory forest into one single Azure Active Directory. Right now, you need to understand the implication of this, right? So you can have a situation, a merger situation, or a acquisition scenario, and I'm talking about large migration, large mergers and acquisitions too, not lower level, right? It could definitely serve all cases, but my personal experience, I have worked with Fortune 500 companies, I have worked with the organizations with over 50,000 um, objects, identities at least, right? You know, so I'm not talking small. And when you talk about these multiple large Fortune 500 companies, mergers and acquisition, and when you can sync those identities into one single Azure Active Directory, that brings its, you know, a, in a, a solution which is beyond comprehension because when instead of migrating these users, a traditional way of migrating them from one Active Directory to another Active Directory is a nightmare. It's, it's years long process. But because you can bring those identities into one single bucket or a repository of identity, and authentication could still be different. They could still authenticate back to their own individual Active Directory. That's the beauty, because once you segregate that, but guess what? From all applications perspective, for all communication collaboration perspective, from the day one, they can get a same ex single transparent experience. So let me try to paint a picture for you where I was uh, the architect for that solution. I had a customer, very interesting customer to be honest, very large customer, that happened to have 21 active directory for us. Believe me, 21 active directory for us. And these active directory for us were belonging to actual 21 different businesses that were owned by one owner, you know, very smart guy. And these 21 businesses were absolutely uh, separate in terms of their business, in terms of their IT, in terms of their politics, in terms of their network. Actually, they used to compete with each other. That's the beauty, right? And then the, the, the owner of the company decided, hey, we need to have a same communication collaboration platform. And remember, what is the complexity here? Each environment, each business was using a different email provide email platform right so i had a mix of um, lotus notes i had a mix of um, google email and gmail um, uh, i had the mix of um, on ram exchange right three or four different types of email solutions there it's a massive challenge but guess what because of this phenomenal feature of using azure active directory as a repository as a bucket of identity i was able to architect the solution, bring those identities into one single common repository as an Azure Active Directory, provide them a single unified, transparent communication collaboration platform. Massive organization. What an impact. What a solution. I mean, you guys can do that and trust me, this is gonna this is gonna speak for yourself if you are if you understand this whole concept, if you can do this work. 
and this is not difficult to be honest it is not difficult it is very easily accomplishable i had another customer which is very interesting scenario i just want to mention that uh, one another large large customer very large fortune 500 company and um, um, they decided they had a uh, they acquired another company very large company from multiple exchange environments now they were very smart and they said hey uh, they were preemptive and what we were able to accomplish that on the day one of their official merger because this merger takes five six months so they engaged us very early and on the very first day of their merger we were able to provide them a transparent single unified communication collaboration platform and that's the power so please do not underestimate the power of ad connect the power of azure active directory power and the solution um, you know the overwhelming scope of this identity management service of azure active directory it is it is just mind blowing when you start getting into that and remember that that migration of the, those hundreds thousands of objects on a traditional on prem active directory migration perspective might have taken years to do that i have zoom in less than 6 months time we were able to do that this is this is the, this is the power of it so i think i have spoken enough about identity types let's move on to the next topic here and that's a comparison between b2b and b2c some of the things that we have already talked let's just look into i given you i have given you this comparative slide so that it can clarify any doubts and establishes a clarity in your mind when you are looking into b2b and b2c so if you look into the B2B, especially the primary scenario that when you're uh, collaborating with Microsoft application, Microsoft 365, Teams, etc., or you create your own application in Azure, then the B2B um, uh, would be a preferred route to go, right? On the other hand, when you are identity access management for modern SaaS or custom-based solution, not first-party Microsoft apps, then the B2C is the right solution right in that case you can use b2c you can say it could be any application SaaS application or anything else right that is custom developed somebody else even your partner develops or somebody else develops in that case you could use azure b2c as an identity provider there and they will go into the authentication shortly and then you can leverage uh, b2c solution now what is it intended for the B2B is intended for business with partners from external organization, like suppliers, partners, vendors, users. They would appear in your Active Direct, Azure Active Directory instance. This is important, as guests, right? These are external B2B identities sitting in your Azure Active Directory, I think we have established that before, as guest identity, right? While this the, on the B2C, um, they are customer of your products and they are managed in a separate B2C Azure Active Directory instance. You will see once we get to the demo and then it will establish all this thing very clear. That's why those demos are very important. Identity providers supported uh, as far as the B2B is concerned. Any external user that has a e genuine email address, you can invite them. Remember that the requirement here is a email address. Email address, SAML, and um, WS Federation based identity provider like Gmail or Facebook, right? You can use that. While on the B2C, the customer uses with local application account, any email address as well as username. Remember that the username is not an option in B2B, right? And various supported social identities, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, name it. And once you get into the demo, you will see that. External user management, obviously, where do you manage these external users in B2B? Because these identities are in your own Azure Active Directory, right? So you manage them there. So basically that's where the password protection comes into picture, which we mentioned earlier. And password expiration policies comes into picture. Your auditing comes into picture. Your risky sign-in comes into picture. Risky users comes into picture. All that is now your onus. You, res you are responsible for that. And that's why you would be managing that. You are responsible for managing them in your own Azure Active Directory. Uh, and um, <clears throat> when you are going into the B2C, this is sitting into 
a separate Azure B2C and only the people that you would allow because Azure B, the Azure Active Directory is accessible to many and many people. B2C directory would be accessible to a very select people, right? That is only required to manage the B2C part and they are being managed in a separate B2C directory. Single sign-on is possible in both scenarios depending on how you do that. Security policy and compliance, right? Here's what it is important to understand. Managed by host, inviting organization or example with conditional access policies. So in this case, who is inviting these B2B users? It is your Azure Active Directory inviting, right? So you are controlling them. On the other hand, the managed by the organization via conditional access and protection. So the identities are coming from Facebook or um, Twitter or LinkedIn, right? So these identities are managed there, not by you. That's the difference. You can also do the conditional access in your environment as a, as a part of it, but basically these identities are coming from different social uh, networking. Now, branding is also important because these identities are coming from the partner world or from inviting email. You have zero control on that. So the inviting organization brand is used, right? The host inviting organization brand is used. This is fully customizable uh, in the B2C that you will see that you could do your own branding here very easily. That covers the B2B or B2C comparison. Now, folks, uh, I think we have covered a whole lot of stuff in Azure Active Directory uh, video one. Um, we will be moving into the video two, which would be authentication and authorization, separate video. I personally want to thank you for your time uh, to watch this video. And if you like this video, please do share it. Please do uh, let your colleagues know because as I said, this is a way to give back to community and um, if others can be benefited with this information, uh, that would be ideal. Once again, thank you again. Uh, thank you very much um, and have the rest of your best of your day and whatever and whichever part of the world you are, stay safe, stay away from COVID and bye-bye.